Hey guys, how you doing? Oh, little color's a little bright today. Yeah. How's that? That's better. Um, so today it's the um the the, the, the rest of that book. Oops. Pause that for a second. <laughs> switch switch screens too quickly. There we go. Move that over there. So I wasn't sure what I was going to do today. So I think I think I'm just going to um, get out the other things. Let's see here. Pop out chat. And let's see. Get that going. Oh, uh, where is the. Come on, scroll, scroll. There we go. Tweeter. Tweet, tweet. Hey, Pasta Babe, how are you doing? And oh, so that is not my username. And there we go. So, are you having a good Sunday? You're not, you're not, uh, uh, you're welcome. This is my, my working area. Except it's not quite tidied up yet. <laughs> okay, love. Have fun. Mwah. And, um, uh, yeah. Good Sunday. Awesome. Hi, Micah. Hi, brother. Awesome. Okay. Um, I guess I'll talk to you later, honey. I hope you have a wonderful day, too. And, uh, awesome, Pasta Babe. That is great. Gotta have a good, gotta have a good day. So, I was thinking I was going to continue on with this, but this would be really hard for you guys to see. So I think I'm just going to move things around a little and um, and pull out the... This is the third or fourth time I'm trying to do this. Let's see. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Hands, hands, there we go. Uh, properties. Configure the video to get that menu out. There we go. Um, that's what was going on. Auto gain and auto white balance again, which almost never ever gets it right. There. Oh, that's not too bad, is it? Um, I don't know why it changed on me like that. See about getting it a little. Hi to me, Natty Birds. <laughs> uh, just say in case you can't see it. Uh, Pasta Babe says, "Say hi to her and not to the birds." Yeah, I don't think this is gonna work. At least, at least not like this. Let's see. So I'm gonna start up the book. And, uh, get myself situated from there. Let's see. Uh, there it is. Oh, mute me. Chapter 53 of Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith The Precious Sword, Natori no Hoto Edi Kamomotsu was a vassal of the lord of Nakura town in Kishu. His ancestors had all been brave warriors, and he had greatly distinguished himself in a battle at Shizu Gataki, which took its name from a mountain in the province of Omi. The great Hideyoshi had successfully fought in the same place so far back as in the eleventh year of the Tensho era fifteen seventy three to fifteen ninety two that is fifteen eighty four with shiba katsui iri kamotsu ancestors were loyal men one of them as a warrior had a reputation second to none he had cut the heads off no fewer than forty-eight men with one sword in due time this weapon came to Edi kamotsu and was kept by him as a most valuable family treasure rather early in life kamotsu found himself a widower his young wife left a son called fujiwaka by and by kamotsu felt lonely married a lady whose name was Sad Sadako. Sadako later bore a son, who was called Goro. Twelve or fourteen years after that, Kamamotsu himself died, leaving the two sons in charge of Sadako. Fujiwaka was at that time nineteen years of age. Sadako became jealous of Fujiwaka, knowing him as the elder son to be the heir to kamamotsu's property she tried by every means to put her own son gora first in the meantime a little romance was secretly going on between a beautiful girl called sei daughter of iwasa shiro and young fujiwaka they had fallen in love with each other were holding secret meetings to their heart's content and vowing promises of marriage at last they were found out and sadako made their conduct a pretext for driving fujiwaka out of the house and depriving him of all rights in the family property attached to the establishment was a faithful old nurse matsui who had brought up fujiwaka from his infancy she was grieved at the injustice which had been done but little did she think of the loss of money or of property in comparison with the loss of the sword the miraculous sword of which the outcast son was the proper owner she thought night and day of how she might get the heirloom for young fujiwaka after many days she came to the conclusion that she must steal the sword from the ihai shrine or rather a wooden tablet in the interior of the shrine bearing the posthumous name of an ancestor which represents the spirit of that ancestor one day when her mistress and the others were absent matsui stole the sword no sooner had she done so than it became apparent that it would be some months perhaps before she should be able to put it into the hands of the rightful owner for of fujiwaka nothing had been heard since his stepmother had driven him out fearing that she might be accused the faithful matsui dug a hole in the garden near the ayuma a little house 
such as is kept in every japanese gentleman's garden for performing the tea ceremony in and there she put the sword meaning to keep it hidden until such time as she should be able to present it to fujiwaka sadako having occasion to go to the budsudan the day after missed the sword and knowing omatsu to have been the only servant left in the house at the time taxed her with the theft of the sword matsu denied the theft thinking that in the cause of justice it was right of her to do so but it was not easy to persuade sadaku who had matsui confined in an out house and gave orders that neither rice nor water was to be given her until she confessed no one was allowed to go near matsu except sadaku herself who kept the key of the shed which she visited only once every four or five days about the tenth day poor matsu died from starvation she had stuck faithfully to her resolution that she would keep the sword and deliver it some day to her young master the lawful heir no one knew of matsui's death the evening on which she had died found sadako seated in an old shed in a remote part of the garden and trying to cool herself for it was very hot after she had sat for about half an hour she suddenly saw the figure of an emaciated woman with dishevelled hair the figure appeared from behind a stone lantern glided along towards the place where sadako was seated and looked full into sadako's face sadako immediately recognized masui and upbraided her loudly for breaking out of her prison go back you thieving woman said she i have not half finished with you yet how dare you leave the place where you are locked up and come to confront me the figure gave no answer but glided slowly along to the spot where the sword had been buried and dug it up sadako watched carefully and being no coward rushed at the figure of matsui intending to seize the sword figure and sword suddenly disappeared sadako then ran at top speed to the shed where matsui had been imprisoned and flung the door open with violence before her lay matsui dead evidently having been so for two or three days her body was thin and emaciated sadako perceived that it must have been the ghost of o matsui that she had seen and mumbled namu amida butsu namu amida butsu the buddhist prayer asking for protection or mercy after having been driven from his family home Edi fujiwaka had wandered to many places begging his food at last he got some small employment and was able to support himself at a very cheap inn at umamachi asakusa temple one midnight he awoke and found standing at the foot of his bed the emaciated figure of his old nurse bearing in her hands the precious sword the heirloom valued beyond all others it was wrapped in scarlet and gold brocade as it had been before and it was laid reverentially by the figure of omatsu at fujiwaka's feet oh my dear nurse said he how glad am i before he had closed his sentence the figure had disappeared my storyteller did not say what became of sadoko or of 
her son end of chapter 53 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc chapter 54 of ancient tales and folklore of japan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c ancient tales and folklore of japan by richard gordon smith chapter fifty four the white serpent god harada kurando was one of the leading vassals of the lord of tsurgu he was a remarkable swordsman and gave lessons in fencing next in seniority to harada among the vassals was one gunayu who also taught fencing but he was no match for the famous harada and consequently was somewhat jealous one day to encourage the art of fencing amongst his vassals the daimo summoned all his people and ordered them to give an exhibition in his presence after the younger vassals had performed the daimo gave an order that harada kurando and hira gundayu should have a match to the winner he said he would present a gold image of the goddess of kawananon both men fenced their best there was great excitement gundayu had never done so well before but harada was too good he won the match receiving the gold image of kawanon from the hands of the daimo amid loud cheering gundayu left the scene of the encounter boiling over with jealousy and vowing vengeance four of his most faithful companions left with him and said they would help him to waylay and assault harada that very evening having arranged this cowardly plan they proceeded to hide on the road which harada must traverse on his return home for three hours they lay there with evil intentions at last in the moonlight they saw harada come staggering along for as was natural on such an occasion he had with friends been indulging in sake freely gundayu and his four companions sprang out at him gundayu shouting now you will have to fight me to the death harada tried to draw his sword but was slow his head whirling gundayu did not wait but cut him to the ground killing him the five villains then hunted through his clothes found the golden image of kawanon and ran off never again to appear on the domains of the lord of sugaru when the body of harada was found there was great grief donosuke harada's son a boy of sixteen vowed to avenge his father's death and obtained from the daimo special permission to kill gundayu as and when he chose the disappearance of gundayu was sufficient evidence that he had been the murderer yonosuke set out that day on his hunt for gundayu he wandered about the country for five long years without getting the slightest clue but at the end of that time by the guidance of buddha he located his enemy at gifu where he was acting as fencing master to the feudal lord of that place donosuku 
found that it would be difficult to get at gundaau in an ordinary way for he hardly ever left the castle he decided therefore to change his name to that of ipai and to apply for a place in gundaau's house as a shugen a samurai's private attendant in this ipai as we shall now call him was particularly lucky for as gundaau was in want of such an attendant he got the place on the twenty fourth of june a great celebration was held at the house of gundaau it being the fifth anniversary of his service to the clan he put his stolen golden image of kawanon on the tokonoma the part of a japanese room raised five inches above the floor where pictures and flowers are placed and a dinner with saki was set before it a dinner was given by gundaau to his friends all of whom drank so deeply that they fell asleep next day the image of kawanon had disappeared it was not to be found a few days later ipai became ill and owing to poverty was unable to buy proper medicine he went from bad to worse his fellow servants were kind to him but they could do nothing that improved his condition ipai did not seem to care he lay in his bed and seemed almost pleased to be getting weaker and weaker all he asked was that a branch of his favorite omato rodea japonica should be kept in a vase before his bed so that he might see it continually and this simple request was naturally complied with in the autumn ipai passed quietly away and was buried after the funeral when the servants were cleaning out the room in which he had died it was noticed with astonishment that a small white snake was curled round the vase containing the omoto they tried to remove it but it coiled itself tighter at last they threw the vase into the pond not caring to have such a thing about them to their astonishment the water had no effect on the snake which continued to cling to the vase feeling that there was something uncanny about the snake they wanted to get it farther away so they cast a net brought the vase and snake to shore again and threw them into a stream even that made but little difference the snake slightly changing its position so as to keep the branch of omoto from falling out of the vase by this time there was consternation among the servants and the news spread to the different houses within the castle gates some samurai came down to the stream to see and found the white snake still firmly coiled about the vase and branch one of the samurai drew his sword and made a slash at the snake which let go and escaped but the vase was broken and to the alarm of all the image of the kawanon fell out into the stream together with a stamped permit from the feudal lord of sugaru to kill a certain man whose name was left blank the samurai who had broken the vase and found the lost treasure seemed particularly pleased and hastened to tell gundau the good news but instead of being pleased that person showed signs of fear he became deadly pale when he heard the story of the death of ipai and of the extraordinary appearance of the mysterious white snake he trembled he realized that ipai was no less a person than yonosuke son of harada 
whose appearance after the murder he had always feared true to the spirit of a samurai however gundayu pulled himself together and professed great pleasure to the person who had brought the image of kawanon moreover to celebrate the occasion he gave a great feast that evening curiously enough the samurai who had broken the vase and recovered the image became suddenly ill and was unable to attend after he had dismissed his guests at about ten p m gundau retired to his bed in the middle of the night he awoke with what he took to be a terrible nightmare there was a choking sensation at his throat he squirmed and twisted gurgling noises proceeded from his mouth to such an extent that he aroused his wife who in terror struck a light she saw a white snake coiled tightly round her husband's throat his face was purple and his eyeballs stood out two inches from his face she called for help but it was too late as the young samurai came rushing in their fencing master was black in the face and dead next day there was a close investigation messengers were dispatched to the lord of tsugu to inquire as to the history of the murdered harada kurando father of yonosuke or ipai and as to that of gundayu who had been in his employ for five years having ascertained the truth the lord of gifu moved by the zeal of yonosuke in discharging his filial duties returned the golden image of kawanon to the bereaved family of harada and in commemoration he worshipped the dead snake at a shrine erected at the foot of kodoyama mountain the spirit is still known as hajuka no myojin the white serpent god end of chapter fifty four recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Chapter 55 of the Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith a festival of the awabi fish manazuru minato is situated on a small promontory of the same name it faces the sagma bay framed for beauty at its back are mountains rising gradually and overtopped in the distance by the majestic fuji to the north on clear days the sandy shores of kozu and oiso twenty-five miles off seem to be almost within arm's reach some people have compared the beauties of manazuru zaki from cape to river with the place in china called sikihiki by the celebrated poet of the country sotoba who wrote sikihiki no fu 
the ode to sikihiki many years ago minamoto no yoritomo after his defeat at the battle of ishibashiyama fled to manazuru minato and stayed there for a few days while waiting for favorable weather to cross to the opposite side the province of awa one can still see i am told the cave in which he hid which retains its old name shito iwa the scenery on the coast is magnificent the rocks rise sheer out of the sea and enclose a perfect little bay on the inside of manazu zaki cape there the fishermen erected a quiet little shrine kibuni jinja where they worship the goddess who guards the fishing of their coast they had but little to complain of in the bay of manzuru the waters were deep and always well stocked with fish such as tai in due season came the sawara giant mackerel and all the smaller migratory fishes including the sardine and anchovy the fishermen had not to complain of until about forty years ago when a strange thing happened on the twenty fourth of june a person from some inland place arrived for a few days sea bathing he was no swimmer and he was drowned the first day his body was never recovered though the fishermen did all they could to find it from this event onwards for a full two years the abundance of fish in the bay grew less and less until it became difficult to catch enough to eat the situation was serious in the extreme some of the elder fishermen attributed the change to the stranger who had been drowned it is our unrecovered body they said that has made our sacred waters change the uncleanliness has offended gugun ohimi our goddess it will never do to go on as we are we must hold a special festival at the temple of kibuni jinja accordingly the head priest iwata was approached he was pleased with the idea and a certain day was fixed upon on the appointed evening hundreds of fishermen gathered together with torches in one hand and shiarau or gohi papers footnote gohi papers are a shinto emblem representing gifts of cloth to the deity usually the god kami some say gohi represent in their curious cutting the kami beating dora a gong used in worship End footnote. fastened on a bamboo in the other they formed into procession and advanced towards the shrine from various directions beating gongs at the temple the priests read from the sacred books and prayed to the goddess that had watched over them and their fisheries not to desert them because their waters had been polluted by a dead body they would search for it by every means in their power and cleanse the bay suddenly while the priest was praying a light the brilliance of which nearly blinded the fishermen flashed out of the water the priest stopped for a moment a rumbling noise was heard at the bottom of the sea and then there arose to the surface a goddess of surpassing beauty probably kawanon gioran she looked at the ceremony which was being held on shore for a full hour and then disappeared with another flash leaving the sound of roaring waves the priest and the elder fishermen considered matters and came to the conclusion that what they had seen was indeed their goddess 
and that she had been pleased at their ceremony also they thought the dead body must still be at the bottom of the bay directly under the spot whence the flashes of light and the goddess herself had appeared it was arranged that two young virgins who could dive should be sent down at the spot to see and two were accordingly chosen sayotome and tamajo wrapped in white skirts these maidens were taken in a boat to where the flashes and the goddess had appeared the girls dived reached the bottom and searched for the body of the man drowned two years before instead of finding it they saw only a small but dazzling light curiosity led them to the spot and there they found hundreds upon hundreds of awabi ear shells fastened upon a rock six feet in height and twenty-five or thirty in length whenever the fish moved they were obliged to raise their shells and it was the glitter of the pearls inside that had attracted the damsels this rock must have been the tomb of the drowned or else the home of the goddess sayotome and tamajo returned to the surface each having taken from the rock a large shell to show the priest as they came to the shore cheers were given in their honor and the priest and the fishermen crowded round them on learning about the awabi shells which they had never before heard of as being in the bay they came to the conclusion that it was not uncleanliness that kept the fish away the lights thrown from the brilliant nacreous shells and pearls inside them must be the cause many times have we heard of the awabi flying they must have flown here at some time within two years the fishermen resolved to remove them it was evident that the goddess had appeared in the light so as to show what it was that kept the fish away no time was lost many hundreds of men and women went down and cleared the place and the fish began to return to manazuro minato at the suggestion of the priest iwata there is held on every twenty fourth of june a matsuri festival the fishermen light torches and go to the shrine for worship all the night through this is called the awabi festival of kabuni note this story was told to me by a man who knows nothing of shell fish he told the story as of the osari a kind of cockle shell dug out of the sand at low tide it is impossible that the story could have referred to other shellfish than haliotis the ear shell or the awabi or the regular pearl oyster diving women have seen the flight of haliotis and described chapter number fifty six of ancient tales and folklore of japan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c ancient tales and folklore of japan by richard gordon smith the spirit of a willow tree saves family honor long ago there lived in yamada village sarashina gun shinato province one of the richest men in the northern part of japan for many generations the family had been rich and at last the fortune descended in the eighty-third generation to gobi yusa the family had no title but the people treated them almost with the respect 
due to a princely house even the boys in the street who are not given to bestowing either compliments or titles of respect bowed ceremoniously when they met gobi yusa gobi was the soul of good nature sympathetic to all in trouble the riches which gobi had inherited were mainly money and land about which he worried himself very little it would have been difficult to find a man who knew less and cared less about his affairs than gobi he spent his money freely and when he came to think of accounts his easy nature let them all slide his great pleasures were painting kakimono pictures talking to his friends and eating good things he ordered his steward not to worry him with unsatisfactory accounts of crops or any other disagreeable subjects the destiny of man and his fate is arranged in heaven said he gobi was quite celebrated as a painter and could have made a considerable amount of money by selling his kakimonos but no that would not be doing credit to his ancestors and his name one day while things were going from bad to worse and gobi was seated in his room painting a friend came to gossip he told gobi that the village people were beginning to talk seriously about a spirit that had been seen by no fewer than three of them at first they had laughed at the man who saw the ghost the second man who saw it they were inclined not to take quite seriously but now it had been seen by one of the village elders and so there could be no doubt about it where do they see it asked gobi they say that it appears under your old willow tree between eleven and twelve o'clock at night the tree that hangs some of its boughs out of your garden into the street that is odd remarked gobi i can remember hearing of no murder under that tree nor even spirit connection with any of my ancestors but there must be something if three of our villagers have seen it yet again where there is an old willow tree some one is sure to say sooner or later that he has seen a ghost if there is a spirit there i wonder whose it is i should like to paint the ghost if i could see it so as to leave it to my descendants as the last ominous sign on the road which has led to the family's ruin that i shall make an effort to do this very evening i will sit up to watch for the thing never had gobi been seized with such energy before he dismissed his friend and went to bed at four o'clock in the afternoon so as to allow himself to be up at ten o'clock at that hour his servant awoke him but even then he could not be got up before eleven by twelve o'clock midnight gobi was at last out in his garden hidden in bushes facing the willow it was a bright night and there was no sign of any ghost until after one o'clock when clouds passed over the moon just when gobi was thinking of going back to bed he beheld arising from the ground under the willow a thin column of white smoke which gradually assumed the form of a charming girl gobi stared in astonishment and admiration he had never thought that a ghost could be such a vision of beauty rather he had expected to see a white 
wild-eyed disheveled old woman with protruding bones the spectacle of whom would freeze his marrow and make his teeth clatter gradually the beautiful figure approached gobi and hung its head as if it wished to address him who and what are you cried gobi you seem too beautiful to my mind to be the spirit of one who is dead if you are indeed spectral do tell me if you may whose spirit are you and why you appear under this willow tree i am not the spirit or ghost of man as you say answered the spirit but the spirit of this willow tree then why do you leave the tree now as they tell me you have done several times within the last ten days i am as i say the spirit of this willow which was planted here in the twenty-first generation of your family that is now about six centuries ago i was planted to mark the place where your wise ancestor buried a treasure twenty feet below the ground and fifteen from my stem facing east there is a vast sum of gold in a strong iron chest hidden there the money was buried to save your house when it was about to fall never hitherto has there been danger but now in your time ruin has come and it is for me to step forth and tell you how by the foresight of your ancestor you have been saved from disgracing the family name by bankruptcy pray dig the strong box up and save the name of your house begin as soon as you can and be careful in future then she vanished gobi returned to the house scarcely believing it possible that such good luck had come to him as the spirit of the willow tree planted by his wise ancestor had said he did not go to bed however he summoned a few of his most faithful servants and at daybreak began digging what excitement there was when at nineteen feet they struck the top of an iron chest gobi jumped with delight and it may almost be said that his servants did the same for to see their honored master's name fall into the disgrace of bankruptcy would have caused many of them to disembowel themselves they tore and dug with all their might until they had the huge and weighty case out of the hole they broke off the top with pickaxes and then gobi saw a collection of old sacks he seized one of these but the age of it was too great it burst and sent rolling out over a hundred immense old-fashioned oblong gold coins of ancient times which must have been worth thirty pounds each gobi yusa's hand shook he could hardly realize as true as good fortune which had come to him bag after bag was pulled out each containing a small fortune until finally the bottom of the box was reached here was found a letter some six hundred years of age saying he of my descendants who was obliged to make use of the treasure to save our family reputation will read aloud and make known that this treasure has been buried by me fuji yusa in the twenty-first generation of our family so that in time of need or danger a future generation will be able to fall back upon it and save the family name he whose great misfortune necessitates the use of the treasure must say greatly do i repent 
the folly that has brought the affairs of our family so low and necessitated the assistance of an early ancestor i can only repay such by diligent attention to my household affairs and also show high appreciation and give kindness to the willow tree which has so long been watching and guarding my ancestor's treasure these things i vowed to do i shall reform entirely gobi yusa read this out to the servants and to his friends he became a man of energy his lands and farms were properly taken care of and the yusa family regained its influential position gobi painted a kakimono of the spirit of the willow tree as he had seen her and this he kept in his own room during the rest of his life it is the famous painting in the yusa gardens today which is called the willow ghost and perhaps it is the model from which most of the willow tree ghost paintings have sprung gobi fenced in the famous willow tree and attended to it himself as did those who followed him end of chapter 56 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter 57 of ancient tales and folklore of japan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by david mckay ancient tales and folklore of japan by richard gordon smith the camphor tree tomb five ri ten miles from shirakawa in the province of iwaki there is a village called yabukimura close by is a grove some four hundred feet square the trees used to include a monster camphor nearly 150 feet in height of untold age, and venerated by villagers and strangers alike as one of the greatest trees in Japan. A shrine was erected to it in the grove, which was known as the Nekoma Myojin Forest, and a faithful old man, Hamada Tsushima, lived there, caring for the tree, the shrine, and the whole grove. One day the tree was felled but instead of withering or dying it continued to grow, and it is still flourishing, though lying on the ground. Poor Hamada Tsushima disemboweled himself when the sacred tree had been cut down. Perhaps it is because his spirit entered the sacred tree that the tree will not die. Here is the story. On the 17th of January in the third and last year of the Meireki period, that is 1658, a great fire broke out in the Homyoji Temple, in the Maruyama Hongo district of Yedo, now Tokyo. The fire spread with such rapidity that not only was that particular district burned, but also a full eighth of Yedo itself was destroyed. Many of the daimyo's houses and palaces were consumed. The Lord Date Tsunamune of Sendai, one of the three greatest daimyo's, who were Satsuma, Kaga, Sendai, had the whole of his seven palaces and houses destroyed by the fire. The other daimyos, or feudal lords, lost only one or two. Lord Date Tsunamune resolved to build the finest palace that could be designed. It was to be at Shinzenza, in Shiba. He ordered that no time should be lost, and directed one of his high officials, Harada Kai Naonori, to see to the matter. Harada, accordingly, sent for the greatest house-building contractor of the day, one Kinokuniya Bunzaemon, and to him he said, You are aware that the fire has destroyed the whole of the town mansions of Lord Date Tsunamune. I am directed to see that the finest palace should be immediately built, second to none except the shoguns. I have sent for you as the largest contractor in Yedo. What can you do? Just make some suggestions and give me your opinion. Certainly, my lord, I can make plenty of suggestions. 
But to build such a palace will cost an enormous amount of money, especially now after this fire, for as there is a great scarcity of large timber in the land. Never mind expenses, said Harada. Those I shall pay as you like and when you like. I will even advance money if you want it. Oh, then, answered the delighted contractor, I will start immediately. What would you think of having a palace like that of Kinkakuji in Kyoto, which was built by the shogun Ashikaga? What I should build would be a finer mansion than that of the present shogun, let alone those of any daimyo. The whole of the hagi, shelves, to be made out of the rarest woods, the tokubashira, kakumono corner post, to be of the nanten, and ceilings of unjointed camphor tree boards, should we be able to find a tree of sufficient size. I can find nearly everything except the last in my own stocks. The camphor trees are difficult. There are but few. They are mostly sacred, and dangerous to interfere with or obtain. I know of one in the forest of Neko Mamiojin in Iwaki province. If I can get that tree, I should indeed be able to make an unjointed ceiling, and that would completely put other palaces and mansions in the second rank. Well, well, I must leave all this to you, said Harada. You know that no expense need be spared, as long as you produce speedily what is required by Lord Date Tsunamune. The contractor bowed low, saying that he should set to and do his best, and he left no doubt delighted at so open a contract, which would enable him to fill his pockets. He set about making inquiries in every direction, and became convinced that the only camphor tree that would suit his purpose was the one before referred to, owing chiefly to its great breadth. Kinokuniya knew also that the part of the district wherein lay this tree belonged to or was under the management of Fujieda Geki, now in the Hanjo district of Yedo, acting as a shogun's retainer, well off, receiving twelve hundred koku of rice a year, but not over-scrupulous about money, of which he was always in need. Contractor Kinokuniya soon learned all about the man, and then went to call. "'Your name is Kinokuniya Bunzaeman, I believe. What, may I ask, do you wish to see me about?' said Fujieda. "'Sir,' said the contractor, bowing low, "'it is as you say.' My name is Kinokuniya Bunzaemon, and I am a wood contractor, of whom perhaps your lordship has heard, for I have built and supplied the wood for many mansions and palaces. I come here craving assistance in the way of permission to cut trees in a small forest called Nekoma Myojin, near the village called Yabukimura in the Sendai district. The contractor did not tell Fujieda Geki, the shogun's retainer or agent, that he was to build a mansion for the daimyo Date Tsunamune and that the wood which he wanted to cut was within that daimyo's domains. For he knew full well that the Lord Date would never give him permission to cut a holy tree. It was an excellent idea to take the daimyo's trees by the help of the shogun's agent, and charge for them fully afterwards. So he continued, I can assure you, sir, this recent fire has cleared the whole market of wood. If you will assist me to get what I want, I will build you a new house for nothing. And by way of showing my appreciation, I ask you to accept this small gift of yen 200, which is only a little beginning. You need not trouble with these small details, said the delighted agent, pocketing the money. But do as you wish. I will send for the four local managers and headmen of the district wherein you wish to cut the trees. And I will let you know when they arrive in Yedo. With them you will be able to settle the matter. The interview was over. The contractor was on the high road, he felt, to getting the trees he required, and the money-wanting agent was equally well pleased that so slight an effort on his part should have been the means of enriching him by yen two hundred, with the promise of more, and a new house. About ten days later, four men, the heads of villages, arrived in Yedo and presented themselves to Fujieda, who sent for the timber contractor, telling the four, whose names were Mosuke, Magozaemon, Yohei, and Jinyemon, that he was pleased to see them, and to note how loyal they had been in their attendance on the shogun, for that he, the shogun, had had his palace burned down in the recent fire, and desired to have one immediately built, the great and only difficulty being the timber. I am told by our great contractor, to whom I shall introduce you presently, that the only timber fit for rebuilding the shogun's palace lies in your district, I myself know nothing about these details, and I shall leave you gentlemen to settle these matters with Kinokuniya, the contractor, so soon as he arrives. I have sent for him. In the meantime, consider yourselves welcome, and please accept of the meal I have arranged in the next room for you. Come along, and let us enjoy it. Fujieda led the four countrymen into the next room, 
and ate with him at the meal, during which time Kinokuniya the contractor arrived and was promptly ushered into their presence. The meal was nearly at an end. Fujieda introduced the contractor, who in his turn said, "'Gentlemen, we cannot discuss these matters here in the house of Lord Fujieda, the shogun's agent. Now that we know one another, let me invite you to supper. At that I can explain to you exactly what I want, in the way of trees out of your district. Of course, you know my family are subjects of your feudal lords, and that we are therefore all the same.' The four countrymen were delighted at so much hospitality. Two meals in an evening was an extraordinary dissipation for them, and that in Yedo. My word, what would they not be able to tell their wives on their return to their villages? Kinokuniya led the four countrymen off to a restaurant called Campanaro in Rio Goku, where he treated them with the greatest hospitality. After the meal, he said, Gentlemen, I hope you will allow me to hew timber from the forest in your village, for it is impossible for me otherwise to attempt any further building on a large scale. Very well, you may hew, said Mosuke, who was the senior of the four, since the cutting of the trees in Nekomamiojin forest is, as it were, a necessity for our lord, they must be cut. It is, in fact, I take it an order from our lord that the trees shall be cut. But I must remind you that there is one tree in the grove which cannot be cut amid any circumstances whatever, and that is an enormous and sacred camphor tree which is very much revered in our district and to which a shrine is erected. That tree we cannot consent to have cut. Very well, said the contractor. Just write me a little permit, giving me permission to cut any trees except the big camphor, and our business will be finished. Kinokuniya had by this time in the evening taken his measure of the countrymen, so shrewdly as to know that they were probably unable to write. <laughs> Certainly, said Mosuke. Just you write out a little agreement, Jinyaman. No, I'd rather you wrote it, Mago, said Jinyaman. And I should like Yohai to write it, said Mago. But I can't write at all, said Yohai, turning to Jinyaman again. Well, never mind, never mind, said Kinokuniya. Will you gentlemen sign the document if I write it? Why, of course, they all assented. That was the best way of all. They would put their stamps to the document. This they did, and after a lively evening, departed, pleased with themselves generally. Kinokuniya, on the other hand, went home fully contented with his evening's business. Had he not, in his pocket, the permit to cut the trees, and had he not written it himself so as to suit his own purpose, he chuckled at the thought of how neatly he had managed the business. Next morning, Kinokuniya sent off his foreman, Chogoro, accompanied by ten or a dozen men. It took them three days to reach the village called Yabukimura, near the Nekomamiojin Grove. They arrived on the morning of the fourth day, and proceeded to erect a scaffold round the camphor tree so that they might the better use their axes. As they began chopping off the lower branches, Hamada Tsushima, the keeper of the shrine, came running to them. Here, here! What are you doing? Cutting down the sacred camphor! Curse you! Stop, I tell you! Do you hear me? Stop at once! Chogoro answered, You need not stop my men in their work. They are doing what they have been ordered to do, and with a full right to do it. I am cutting down the tree at the order of my master, Kinokuniya, the timber contractor, who has permission to cut the tree from the four headmen sent to Yedo from this district. I know all that, said the caretaker, but your permission is to cut down any tree except the sacred camphor. Well, there you are wrong, as this letter will show you, said Chogoro. Read it yourself. And the caretaker, in great dismay, read as follows. To Kinokuniya Bunzaemon timber contractor Yedo. In hewing trees to build a new mansion for our lord, all the camphor trees must be spared except the large one said to be sacred in the Nekomamiojin grove, in witness whereof we set our names. Jinyemon, Magozaemon, Mosuke, Yohei. Representing the local county officials. The caretaker, beside himself with grief and astonishment, sent for the four men mentioned. On their arrival, each declared that he had given permission to cut anything except the big camphor. But Chogoro said that he could not believe them, and in any case he would go by the written document. Then he ordered his men to continue their work on the big camphor. 
Hamada Tsushima, the caretaker, did harakiri, disemboweling himself there and then, but not before telling Chogoro that his spirit would go into the camphor tree to take care of it and to wreak vengeance on the wicked Kinokuniya. At last the efforts of the men brought the stately tree down with a crash, but then they found themselves unable to move it. Pull as they might, it would not budge. Each time they tried, the branches seemed to become alive. Faces and eyes became painful with the hits they got from them. Pluckily, they continued their efforts, but it was no use. Things got worse. Several of the men were caught and nearly crushed to death between the branches. Four had broken limbs from blows given in the same way. At this moment, a horseman rode up and shouted, My name is Matsumae Tetsunosuke. I am one of the Lord of Sendai's retainers. The board of councillors in Sendai have refused to allow this camphor tree to be touched. You have cut it, unfortunately. It must now remain where it is. Our feudal lord of Sendai, Lord Date Tsunamune, will be furious. Kinokuniya the contractor planned an evil scheme and will be duly punished, while as for the shogun's agent, Fujieda Geki, he also must be reported. You yourselves return to Yedo. We cannot blame you for obeying orders. But first, give me that forged permit signed by the four local fools, who, it is trusted, will destroy themselves. Chogoro and his men returned to Yedo. A few days later, the contractor was taken ill, and a shampooer was sent to his room. A little later, Kinokuniya was found dead. The shampooer had disappeared, though it was impossible for him to have got away without being seen. It is said that the spirit of Hamada Tsushima, the caretaker, had taken the form of the shampooer in order to kill the contractor. Chogoro became so uneasy in his mind that he returned to the camphor tree, where he spent all his savings in erecting a new shrine and putting in a caretaker. This is known as the Kusunoki Dzuka, the camphor tree tomb. The tree lies there, my storyteller tells me, at the present day. The End End of chapter 57 Recording by David McKay End of Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith So we're all done. I almost had to leave there for a second. Apparently... Someone in the area thinks that they're going to get a collapsible um, potty, portable potty, for ten bucks. And uh, I had one for my dad. You know the the hosp the kind that you you know you can have in the room with you with the pot, or you have it above your toilet so that. It's got arms and you can get up from it easier for older people who are having trouble. Well, apparently somebody thinks you can get one that's collapsible and portable for like 10 bucks. So um, I was asked to come up and um, help help them get it into the car and then they did, decided they didn't want it. So uh, And then somebody else came along and bought it in paid me 10 bucks for it. I was asking 20, but, you know, 10's fine. And, um, but yeah, so, it's like, what do you expect? Oh, um, and this here, I spent most of the day yesterday stringing up this intricate pattern, and, um, doing it the way the stitch that I'm doing it in where the pattern will work out is not going to work. It's not going to work at all, unfortunately. So I've, uh, I can do it another way, but I have to um, do the pattern different for it to work the other way, so a different way. So um, I have to unstring all these, and I tried it three times to get it to work, but everything turns out too tight and it's not it just won't work so it's just not going to work this way unfortunately I'm kind of 
annoyed a little bit, but I have to unstring everything and, and uh, put more put more beads on there of a different pattern. Yeah, it's a bummer for sure. And it's, uh, I was trying really, really hard to get it to work, but it ends up being way too tight. So now I get to unstring it. It took me forever to string it yesterday, because like a simple pattern is pretty easy to string. But this one was like, the repeat was, um, I don't know, uh, ten rows or five rows. And it's um, 30, it's 120 beads per repeat of the pattern. And to get, ah, shoot, and to get, so to get it, you've got to put on 120 beads. So you can't uh, get that to, um, you know, you can't memorize that as well. Like some of them I can memorize pretty easily, but such a, like I can memorize portions of this pattern, but I can't memorize the whole thing. It's too, it's too big. And, uh, yeah, it's a bummer that it didn't work out. There we go. But oh well, what do you do? So I'll let you guys go. Um, I hope you guys have an absolutely wonderful day. And we will see you next time at LibriVox.org. Uh, just a second. LibriVox.org. To... Yeah. Yeah, that's a... Uh, that is a lot... But, so I'll, maybe I'll just do a simple pattern and, uh, something that, you know, it was a, it was a big, big, um, really big round too. It's, uh, 13 or 26 beads per row or round, I guess. So it's, it's like, it's not like it's just a, you know, one color, one color, one color, because that I could have, um, instead of being a spiral, it would have turned out like a stripes, and that would have been, I could do no matter what, the, but, uh, yeah, unfortunately, it's not going to work out. Kind of a bummer. But, hey, that's the way, that's the way it works sometimes, and, and, uh, for it to be loose enough so that I can make it flat, I need to do a um, single crochet stitch instead of a slip stitch. And um, it's uh, it makes a big difference in, in the pattern, unfortunately. Because one kind of ends up being like a square instead of it staggering around. And it staggers... Uh, I, I'm sort of, my hips are really bad, but, um, yeah, I'm feeling a bit better. Thank you. And, um, I think the, uh, we're going to get hit by, probably by the storm that hit Florida. I, I would guess, uh, sometime next week. So we'll see how that works, see if that works at all. And, uh, all that kind of fun stuff. See you, honey. And, uh, yeah, so, I love you guys. Give a check out to LibriVox.org. <laughs> yeah, the easiest pets ever. Somebody else looks after them. <laughs> wait, wait, wait till you find out what happens later. <laughs> Uh, oh well. Okay, love you guys. I'll let you guys go, and I'm gonna cry over my spilt milk a little. Not really. <laughs> I didn't spill any milk, but I mean the pattern. <laughs> um, can I have a 
figured out because it was a really nice pattern. Oh, I'm kind of bummed that that's not going to work. Like I could do the pattern in a smaller one, but I have to redesign the whole pattern for it to work as a smaller spiral, like like the size uh, the size like the six beads around, or larger than that. So darn it. Oh well. Okay, let you guys go. Love you guys. Bye. Uh, where is it?